Hi, my name is Daniel Yoon, and welcome to my channel. Yes, that opening is meant to be a reference to the Timeless channel by Taylor Ramos and Tony Joe, Every Frame of Painting. Without further ado, let's get to the video. I love movies. I find a kinship in people that appreciate them like I do. This is one of the reasons I'm a fan of Hideo Kojima, the video game creator, director of the Metal Gear Solid series, Police Knots, Snatcher, and most recently, Death Stranding in 2019. And I think he puts it in a way many film fans can relate. Quote, Just like the human body is 70% water, I'm 70% film. While this is a figure of speech, there is some truth to it. I learned, or rather was taught, much from film, including things I didn't learn in school or from my parents. Through film, I've met different races and cultures, seen the world through the eyes of other generations, and adopted ideologies. I've been to new countries and exotic lands, and gone to outer space as well. I've traveled to the distant past and far into the future. i fought in ancient conflicts and fictional wars. I've even experienced what it's like to be something other than human. Part of my sustenance growing up was the virtual experience I had through this medium. There's nothing unique about this. I'm sure everyone in my generation is the same. For films are no longer mere diversions. All of the films I've seen, regardless of their content, are part of my virtual life. I've been shaped by my actual experiences, but also by my virtual experiences through film." End quote. Because of my history, there's a reason I was drawn to film. I won't bore you with the details, that's not why I'm here. But I will say that I spent a normal amount of my childhood watching movies every now and then. Soon after, I was able to experience so much more film than I could ever imagine. I didn't just catch up on the films I had missed year after year. My family only went to the movies once or twice a year. I got to watch films by the truckload, essentially. There was that moment of time where I had the opportunity to do so. And so, I read the Wikipedias, the IMDb's, about the ones that really impacted me. Reading the stories of behind-the-scenes shenanigans and learning all about all three stages of production intrigued me. And here I am now. Years later, I've compiled a list of films that I believe are the best. For me, at least. If you'd like to see the highest rated films of all time, you've got plenty of options. They're flawed, but you might find a gem or two among those lists. IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, even Roger Ebert. And a few others can help you form your own opinion. This is mine. If you have your own list, feel free to discuss in the comments. But for now, I'll begin with number 27. La La Land, released in 2016. I'm going to try to keep my thoughts to a minimum as going into full-blown review for every film would be an insane task of both writing and editing. I watched La La Land three times in theaters. It appears that reception has dulled as time has passed, but I still think it's a brilliant bit of film. Some people seem to agree with me as it boasts a strong 8 out of 10 on IMDb. Damon Chazelle's direction shines and the music with his longtime collaborator Justin Hurwitz is outstanding. I'm not a fan of most musicals, but Chazelle's writing makes sure the film doesn't go off the deep end of the musical genre. Energetic, fun, and whimsical, it exemplifies a lot of Chazelle's strengths. The cinematography is excellent, and the protagonists are wonderful to watch. Number 26, Pacific Rim released in 2013. Truth be told, I haven't watched Guillermo del Toro's work. I've heard nothing but good things about Pan's Labyrinth and Hellboy, but I was never interested in them. Pacific Rim, on the other hand, is exactly my thing. A sci-fi, big-budget, mecha film with kaiju in it, Pacific Rim has a great sense of scale, and del Toro knows how to capture the CGI action. Too often, CGI becomes a boring, virtual mess. It can be either Michael Bay nonsense, or something akin to the Marvel MCU. A more recent example being Spider-Man Far From Home. Just a lot of virtual boredom. Pacific Rim, on the other hand, has some of the best set pieces ever put to film. With great music by Ramin Djawadi and great main roles by Charlie Hunnam and Idris Elba. This is a great dumb fun film. I've rewatched it plenty of times. Number 25, Toy Story 3 released in 2010. Every single Toy Story film thus far has been amazing. Deftly blending humor, heart, and narrative across all its films, each film has specific strengths as well. 
Toy Story 3 in particular I found to be the most moving Toy Story. With some of the most heart-wrenching moments put to film, this is proof that Disney will never match Pixar. Disney may have bought them, but they will never achieve the heights that Pixar has when it comes to storytelling. If you haven't watched the Toy Story, please watch them all. They're amazing. Number 24, Mission Impossible, Fallout, released in 2018. Tom Cruise is a madman, and the world thanks him for it. His insane stunts are a big draw for the Mission Impossible series, and a big reason why the most recent Bond films will never be able to match Mission Impossible beat for beat. With Fallout in particular, there's great hand-to-hand -hand combat, chases, and a very suitable espionage story. Casino Royale and Skyfall may be great films, undoubtedly, but Fallout is outstanding from start to finish with great returning roles and new ones like Henry Cavill. All in all, it's a great time at the movies. Twenty-three, The Raid 2, Barandal, released in 2014. The first film made a big splash when it released worldwide in 2012. They just made everything better in the sequel. You gotta love it when a film's predecessor lays so much of the groundwork for its successor. The raid ups the ante with action choreography, and not only that, it has a fantastic villain and an intriguing story. You wouldn't expect great editing and cinematography in the non-action portions of a martial arts film like this, but Gareth Evans and his crew managed to build upon everything from the film prior. And apparently, they were considering making the third film, and this could have been a trilogy. But, some decided not to go through with that project. While that's unfortunate, we still get one of the greatest action films of all time. And I'm more than happy with that. HA! Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, released in 2018. Co-written by one of the co-writers of Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, 21 and 22 Jump Street, and the Lego movie, all films I love, by the way. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is a joyous celebration of the source material and an exceeding departure from it. Even if you're unfamiliar with Spider-Man, which at this point with three cinematic Spider-Man is like saying you're unfamiliar with Batman, into the Spider-Verse works on every conceivable level, with an engaging story, beautiful and unique animation, a fantastic score by Daniel Pemberton, a great soundtrack, and charm and wit overflowing. It's a great film. If you're a fan of Marvel, Spider-Man, or Miles Morales, you'll probably get more out of this film. Personally, I freaked out in the theater when the post credit scene happened. But, that's how it goes with films that have source material. So even if you're going in blind for this film, you're bound to have a good time. Number 21, The Grand Budapest Hotel, released in 2014. If I'm not mistaken, my watch order for director Wes Anderson's films has been Moonrise Kingdom, released in 2012, The Grand Budapest Hotel, and then The Fantastic Mr. Fox, released in 2009. I love them all, but I love this film the most. Wes Anderson's idiosyncratic style is extremely pleasing for me. His sets and shots are modern art in the best sense. He's an artist that doesn't rely on pretentious farce or self-projection from a snobby audience to achieve critical and commercial success. The Grand Budapest Hotel is proof of that. With laughs and poignant writing, the film explores an intimate tale that isn't afraid to make things depressing. And it's not just melodrama, and it's not just sadness for sadness sake. His films weave together his quirky visuals and his whimsical characters and stories that are enjoyable to watch and aren't just awards bait. Number 20, Nightcrawler. Jack Jolin Hall is a fantastic actor. I want proof, watch any of his films. But I recommend Nightcrawler in particular. Dan Gilroy's directorial debut is astonishing with this film. While his works after Nightcrawler 
Nightcrawler don't quite live up to this film. Nightcrawler is nonetheless an unnerving, absorbing film that is realistic, depressing, and dark. So dark. I have no doubt the film can be analyzed under a multitude of lenses and not be found wanting. For me, it's an excellent character study that examines the human condition. When you see it, you'll know what I mean. Number 19, Sicario, released in 2015. Denis Villeneuve, or should I say Denis Villeneuve, I'm, apologies if I mispronounce that, has not missed the mark since 2013. This man directed two films in that year, one of them entitled Prisoners with Hugh Jackman. This film in 2015, Arrival the year after that, Blade Runner 2049 in 2017, and Dune, which looks fantastic and is set to debut later in 2021. Sicario's cinematography is special because it has the one and only Roger Deakins at the helm. If you're a fan of Cinefix as I am, you know who I'm talking about. But if you don't know the reason that the shots in Sicario look so good, it's because of this man. Look him up to see what else his brilliant eye has captured. Hint, hint. He's also done 1917 and 2019, Blade Runner 2049, Skyfall, and No Country for Old Men. Sicario is a twisted look at the current war on drugs, the cartels versus the government. It's a great crime film that isn't some run-of-the-mill cop drama. Brilliantly paced and exceedingly well edited. It's worth watching for the story alone, the performances, the cinematography, the music by the now-deceased Johan Johansson. But you lucky viewer get to get all of that in one amazing film number 18 chef released in 2014 chef was a triumphant return for jean favreau i'm not a huge fan of his but i did like zathura and two other hits he made you may have heard of them they were called iron man and iron man 2. chef like inception was an allegory for the movie making process Chef thrives on its energy and wholesomeness. Its soundtrack oozes charm, and John Leguizamo is the true highlight of the film. Go in blind and don't spoil any of the remainder smaller surprises for yourself. Which is what you should do for all movies, to be honest. Anyways, this film has great writing, a simple but effective story, and delicious food. I was watching it while waiting for a delayed Greyhound bus one time in New York City, and the person that happened to see my screen couldn't help but exclaim, well, they curse. And then thereafter they said, that looks good. Number 17, Inglorious Bash... Is it a curse word? I might get censored by YouTube for that. So, I'll censor that as well, but... It's on screen, you should know what it is. Released in 2009. I can talk about Quentin Tarantino's usually strong writing, the interesting alternative history aspect of the film, the all-star cast, but Christoph Waltz, man. He would return three years later in Tarantino's Django Unchained, and he was just as wonderful then. Apparently, Inglourious wouldn't have been made without Christoph Waltz, according to Tarantino. I can see that. He plays such an integral part of the film, I can't imagine it without him. The film has your usual Tarantino violence, music by the legendary Ennio Morricone, and is immaculately put together in one wonderful whole. Watch it! Number 16, Ratatouille, released in 2007. Brad Bird's movies have always had charm for me. Even his less popular recent film, Tomorrowland, has appealed for me. But Ratatouille pulls together Pixar charm with some of his best work, with Michael Giacchino composing the music, but you know that at least the score is going to be good. Ratatouille is, in many ways, the least marketable Pixar film. Let's set aside some of the other ones, but... Anyways. With Rats as the protagonist and the world of fine dining as its focus, it would be understandable if this film flopped. But it didn't. Accessible and perfectly written, it's a wonderful look at cuisine and passion. One of the near final remarks by anti ego in the film should be enough for the film to be respected for its writing. You know the one. I love this film. Number 15 Iron Giant. 
released in 1999. And right on to another Brad Bird film. Years prior, Bird wasn't at Pixar. He was at Warner Brothers Feature Animation, and he made a classic. Warner had some horrible marketing and didn't know how to sell the film, so they didn't do great commercially. Thankfully, time has been kind to the Iron Giant. Pleasant time capsule into the Cold War. Well, that does sound strange for me to say it like that. But the film has a blend of animation that holds up 2D and 3D. Great sci-fi design for the Iron Giant and ideas that were then stolen, repurposed, imitated, and or you may say that there's much intertextuality because of the Iron Giant in films like Transformers and Bumblebee. In the end, the Iron Giant is a film that truly is family friendly. It's not just some kid's film, it has depth. Number 14, Koe no Katachi, released in 2016. Kyoto Animation's work should be viewed just for the animation alone. The fact that it is the only anime film on this list speaks volumes of its quality. That, and what taste I have in films, if it isn't obvious already. Heartbreaking and visually stunning, Koe no Katachi is a must-watch for anyone interested in good drama. Based on the manga of the same name, I honestly feel there's no need for me to read it based on how excellent this film is. The source material may be amazing, but Kyoto Animation may have made their magnum opus with this film. It stands not only as an anime film, or an animated film, but a great tale of human tragedy, suffering, and growth. Number 13, Argo, released in 2012. Prior to Argo, Ben Affleck had directed the well-received Gone Baby Gone and The Town. I've only seen The Town and was only impressed by Jeremy Renner in that film. It wasn't really my thing, otherwise. But for Argo, Affleck got to direct a screenplay by Chris Terrio. His more recent filmography may be less than stellar, but Argo more than makes up for it. Argo covers the exploits of a CIA agent extracting US hostages during the 1979-1981 Iranian hostage crisis. A riveting, exciting look into the movie industry unlike others of its kind. It also makes sure that the film is not overwhelmed by the past like other films. That is to say, it doesn't put on rose-tinted nostalgia glasses and puts out reference after reference with no added quality to the film itself. Full of twists and turns, Argo's a witty talent thriller that works with its cast and writing alone, but it goes so much further because of other factors. Watch it and enjoy yourself. Number 12, First Man, released in 2018. Look at what we have here. Another Damien Chazelle film. Are you all getting that? I'm a fan. A sobering, captivating look at the space race. The film's focus on Neil Armstrong, along with some creative freedom, make for a wholly alluring film. Further great direction from Chazelle, great cinematography, and wonderful acting coalesce into one of the best space exploration films ever. Another collaboration with Justin Hurwitz for the music further adds to the quality of the film. Number 11, Memento, released in 2000. Based on a short story that's actually worth reading, Memento is a haunting, dark psychological film that toys with the audience in the best possible way. Christopher Nolan's first wide release film, as Falling was an independent film where he paid for the film stock, and also wrote, directed, filmed, edited, and produced that film. Memento would possess many hallmarks of the Christopher Nolan oeuvre. Smart, messing with time, well-written, well-paced, and containing a unique premise, Memento is a fantastic crime film. In combination with its many unique aspects, as well as an amazing performance by Guy Pearce, it's a dark drama worth your time. At time. No, not really, I'm just playing. At number 10, we have The Fortress, released in 2017. I probably could stand to watch more Korean films, but man, am I happy I caught this one. There are plenty of dreary, pompous Korean films that are adored by critics and audiences alike. Some, I couldn't agree with. Others, I understand their merit, but don't personally enjoy them. Yet others, I simply do not like. The Fortress is a drama that, at first glance, just seems like a wards bait. 
The period piece with ancient costume design meant to appeal to the award circuit and die after it gets its share of awards. But that is in the fortress. This film has excellent dialogue and covers a point in history where, of course, there's plenty of creative freedom, I'm sure. The music by Ryuichi Sakamoto elevates the film. The sound cinematography, the excellent acting, it's all great. It's all why it's number 10 for me. Number 9. Masquerade, released in 2012. Would you look at that? Another Korean film. And another period piece at that. And also stars Lee Byung Han. I've chosen this film for a reason. I found that this film covers an array of human emotion that The Fortress does not. Not every film has to, but I do believe that a multitude of emotions properly communicated and vicariously experienced by the audience is far more than one with literally one or few emotions. It makes it literally one note. Or few note, I suppose. Masquerade is a tale of loyalty, of taking on a monumental task and doing what you can for your people. We experience much along with our protagonist, and Masquerade is one of the few films that goes through emotions far more effectively than others. Which, let's be honest, many don't at all. Number 8. Inside Out. Released in 2015. The top Pixar film on this list, Inside Out is not only a rigorously researched film on the human mind, it also works as a narrative. Sometimes, abstract or surreal ideas are difficult to put to film. And even if they are, they only appeal to a niche audience, which are usually the conceited types. Inside Out is not one of those films. It has the usual Pixar wit and humor. It's fun and also skillfully goes through a range of emotions like Masquerade. It's also aided by another brilliant score by Michael Giacchino and one of the best directors at Pixar. Pete Docter, who also directed Monsters, Inc. in 2001 and Up in 2009. It's filled with childish imagination, but it's not immature. That's the Pixar way. Number 7. Whiplash, released in 2014. The third and top tier Damien Chazelle film on my list, Whiplash was Chazelle's directorial debut. One of the few films where I felt compelled to read and then actually read the screenplay. I believe the final product made some wise decisions in editing, but I do wish a few things had been kept in. Regardless, this is a great introductory effort. So great as in my top 10, isn't it? With editing, writing, and direction that exceeds his peers or predecessors, Chazelle has set the standard for future directors. Whiplash is an absolute must-watch. Every film I mentioned has been, but the top 10 even more so. Whiplash has great acting, dialogue, moments, it's one of the greatest films ever made. Number 6. Steve Jobs. Released in 2015. We arrive at an Aaron Sorkin film. Steve Jobs was directed by Danny Boyle. There are many of his artistic flourishes that are exceedingly appealing to watch. But the main draw of this film is the dialogue. Tarantino has great writing, as does Sorkin. Personally, I like Sorkin's writing better. Far more insightful, snappy, and witty, Sorkin dialogue makes you feel like you got smarter just by listening. As if just by hearing a Sorkin conversation, you received intelligence through osmosis. The cast is incredible, and it may very well be Sorkin's last foray into the world of technology aside from another film. But if we only got this film and that one, I'd still be more than happy. Steve Jobs has some of the best dialogue ever put to film. Maybe the best. Oh, and the score by Daniel Pemberton is Amazing. Number 5. The Social Network. Released in 2010. David Fincher is one of the directors of our era that rarely misses. And since this film is on the list, it should be obvious that this film isn't a miss. The other film in the technocrat duology by Aaron Sorkin, The Social Network, is a captivating look at business, backstabbing, college, and post-college life. Fincher is known for his darker fare, so I'm honestly curious as to what drew him to the script. Regardless, his precise direction and Sorkin's writing, along with a fantastic cast, make this an instant classic. This film opened my eyes to how great films could be. It's probably the one I've watched the most. It's that good. Number 4. Fight Club, released in 1999. Another David Fincher film. 
can you blame me? White Club is one of those films that sites like IMDb say is one of the best of all time. And in this instance, they're actually right. White Club deconstructs modern materialism and meaning. There's a very low likelihood of this happening, but there is a chance it could send you into a downward spiral of nihilism if you're prepared. Or we could just get a Tyler Durden shirt in direct opposition to the film's message. But eh, who cares, right? Anyways, this is a whirlwind of a tale where I found that the source material was actually outmatched by the adaptation. Heck, even the author thought so too. Number 3, Interstellar, released in 2014. Christopher Nolan returns in my top 3. Interstellar is well regarded on IMDb and in South Korea, but I understand that there's quite a divide among some people who didn't enjoy the film. I have no intention on staying on this topic of negativity, so just know that for those who don't like it, you're entitled to your opinion, but just don't be a jerk about it. Anyways, Hoyt Van Hoytum has done some outstanding cinematography for Interstellar, and the concept of the film is explored in such a fashion where I was a part of the audience where I was more than along for the ride. Great music by the renowned Hans Zimmer, and a fantastic, terrific cast with charming character interactions make this film a sci-fi classic in my eyes. An optimistic look at humanity that does go off the deep end, but in a good way. Number two, Inception, released in 2010. At number two is a Nolan film. That's right, Inception is another sci-fi classic. As I mentioned with my chef entry, Inception is a fun look at the movie making process, but whereas Chef was more explicit, Inception is more subtle. Even with that aside, Inception works as a heist film, thriller, action epic, and more. It's smart and supremely satisfying. I'm sure there are those that would take an opportunity to undermine its merits by noting how it may or may not have been influenced by other similar works. Well, that's the nature of the world. References and all. It's intertextuality. Inception may have stood on the shoulders of others, but that still means it's on top of every other work out there. Inception was one of the greatest films of all time. But this isn't a list of pure merit, technical skill, or objective truths. Inception has a lot going for it, and it happens to really like it. Number one, The Dark Knight, 2008. We end with Christopher Nolan's Piece de Resistance, the crime action thriller that also happens to have a superhero in it. A drama that is meticulously written in its philosophy, dialogue, and story, The Dark Knight has a great hero and a great villain. A character that has a good foil could make for a good film. But the opposites of the Joker and the Batman is one of the greatest matchups in history. Justice versus Anarchy, good versus evil. If ever there was the greatest personification of good and evil, it would be the protagonist and antagonist of the Dark Knight. Filled with astute monologues, the Dark Knight has a great cast, plot, premise, and score for the ages. Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard bring their A-game for this film. Wally Pfister's cinematography is magnificent. This is my favorite film of all time. So, that was my list of films that stood out for me. 27 of the greatest ones for me personally. Films of theater, photography, novels, music, all put together into condensed form for the greatest impact. They are the distillation of the best of those things. And that's why I love them. Stop your
And that is all for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully in the future I can share with you more of my thoughts on film and much more. Take care. Travel every day. Huh.